to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach its statutes and judgments in all Israel. Ezra chapter 7, verse number 10. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Ezra. We're so glad that you've joined us. Hope that you'll locate your Bible and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study of this practical book of Ezra. As always, we're so glad that you've joined us for our study together today. And we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and members of the churches of Christ. The Lord's church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. You could visit on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night. Any of the times they meet, they'd be more than happy for you to stop by. You'll find people at the Lord's church who are concerned about going by the Bible only, who love the souls of men and women, and who are kind and friendly and welcoming to visitors. And so check out the Lord's Church in your area. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, which is simply a work of the Lord's Church, we'd love to help you in your study of God's Word. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We've got over 500 lessons on all Old Testament, New Testament books, and a wide variety of topical studies as well, and they're all available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of those, you can fill out our media request form. We can give you a free da digital download almost instantly, or if you need a DVD or a CD or transcript, we'd be happy to mail that to you free of charge as well. And so check out our website. If you've got questions or comments, anything we can help you with, please let us know and we'll try to answer those in a timely fashion as well. Also, and in our fast-paced world today, where everybody has a smartphone, we now have apps for the Android and iPhone. We encourage you to check those out. That's a great way to study the Word of God on the go. Friend, as we turn our attention to the wonderful book of Ezra, Ezra is one of those books where we now see God, His people, and God working with them, coming back together, united with one heart to serve and to praise and to put Him and His teachings first. But it took a lot of work to get Israel to this point. To understand the book of Ezra, we need to remember that here's what happened prior to that. Israel, because of their unfaithfulness, uh, and Judah, because of their unfaithfulness, they were carried away captive uh, by the Assyrians. Israel was, and Judah, the two southern tribes, were carried away captive by the Babylonians, just as God promised. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 12, God promised His people would go into 70 years of harsh captivity, captivity under the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the Babyl Babylonians. Just as He promised that would happen, He also promised at the end of that, they would be released. You look at the last verse of Isaiah 44, first verse of Isaiah 45, we find that God promised His servant Cyrus would release His uh, people and they would now go back to serve Him. In three deportations, 606, 597, and 586, God's people went into captivity. And at the end of that, in the year 536, in perfect fulfillment with what God promised, Israel now returns to rebuild and to worship God. And so one of the key words that you'll find in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is the word build, rebuild, or restore. It's all about getting back in a right relationship with God and putting first things first. You know, one of the key verses I find in the book of Ezra is found in Ezra chapter 1, 
Verse number five. Look at this verse with me. The Bible says, Then the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, with all whose spirit God had moved, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. For a long time, this house has been lying waste. Everything they held dear was destroyed. And now these leaders of Israel have the, 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 the mindset, we're going to go back, we're going to rebuild, we're going to get back where we were with God. Friend, isn't it always a good idea? Isn't it always the right heart? When bad things happen, when our life faces struggles, when difficulty arises, isn't it always good to do a little examination and get back where we ought to be with God if necessary? 2 Corinthians 13, 5. The Bible says this, Test yourselves. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Israel now says, hey, we need to rebuild. We need to get back with God. And that, that, that key phrase that you'll hear throughout the book, the word of the Lord, chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 9, verse 4, their ears are attentive now, and it's to the word of God. You know, we find in chapter 6, one of the key chapters, where you have the restoration of the temple. It's completed and dedicated, and that's such a powerful, moving idea with the Israelites. But as you think about the book of Ezra, it'll do us a little good to consider who Ezra the man was. We learn in Nehemiah 12, verse 26 and verse 36, that Ezra was both a scribe and a priest. That is, he has the right to priesthood, but he was also a scholar in the law, one who studied, wrote down, transcribed the scriptures. He was a man of the book, and he was one who was willing to dedicate himself in the service of Almighty God. It's believed that Ezra wrote the book of Ezra, and many believe that he may have penned, although under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Psalm 119 and compiled the books of Chronicles. And so God used him as a scribe in that way as well. But what was Ezra's greatest trait? Ezra is known as that scribe who first prepared his heart. Notice in your Bible, Ezra, what made Ezra a great man? Look in Ezra chapter 7, and I want you to see Ezra's heart. Look in Ezra 7, verse number 10. What made Ezra such a great worker for God? For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. Before they prepared the first brick, before they put the first nail in the first two by four, before any preparation took place in rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the walls of the city, rebuilding Israel to its former glory, Ezra prepared his heart. What's that mean? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Heart's here, right? As you think in your heart, so are you. Ezra prepared his mind to seek God. He made up his mind. Whatever God says, that's what we're going to do. He not only prepared his mind to seek the law of the Lord, he prepared it to teach others God's commandments and statutes and to help and encourage people to do that. And so Ezra was a great man of, of faith and prayer and, and moral conviction and whatever God said. That's what Ezra was concerned about. Now let's think, as we look to the book of Ezra, let's think about some some practical messages we can take from this book and apply to our everyday lives today. What are they? Number one, you can always trust the Word of God. It will never lie. It will never lead you astray. And whatever it says, that's going to happen. How do we know that? Look at Ezra 1, verse number 1. Ezra chapter 1, and notice what the Bible says. It's just a pretty simple statement, but it says this. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing. Well, what was that proclamation? That all the Israelites could go home and that they could work towards serving their God. But here's what I want you to see. Isaiah 44, verse 28. Isaiah 45, verse 1. God called him my servant. 
He's talking about Cyrus. Seventy years before that, in Jeremiah 29, verses 7 through 11, God said they would go into 70 years of harsh captivity by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, and when that was over, they would come out. To the date, 70 years, Cyrus is stirred up to let God's people go. Friend, what do we learn as a practical lesson from this? You can always trust the Word of God to be right and to be true and to never lead you astray. This is why Jesus would say, you'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. John 8 verse 32. What is that truth? Sanctify them. Jesus prayed to the Father by your truth. Your word is truth. Friend, put your trust, put your hope, and put your confidence in the Word of God. It is impossible for God to lie. Titus 1 verse 2. Hebrews 6 verse 18. God does not change. Malachi 3 verse 6. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if I put my trust in the Word of God, my life is going to be so much happier and so much more blessed by my response to the Word of God. Secondly, as a practical lesson from the book of Ezra, we learn that like with these people who are now coming back to serve God, there ought to be a sense of joy when people worship the Almighty God. Look at Ezra chapter 3, and I want you to look at what the Bible says in verses 10 through 12. Look at their sense of joy here. Ezra 3, verse 10 through 12. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. Why? For He is good. His mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. These people have such a heart for getting back to God worshiping and pray, And you can imagine after 70 years of persecution, harsh captivity, being slaves, they're now so delighted to be back where they can worship God. Sometimes we take it for granted, the privilege we have to gather freely, to worship God and to praise Him. But friends, through a lot of human history, people have not been afforded that right. People have had to die for that right. People have had to suffer because they wanted to worship God according to the Scripture. We need to realize what a joy and what a blessing that is. We can worship God in spirit and in truth. John 4 verse 24, we can rejoice in the Lord. Philippians 4 verse 4, we can sing, we can pray, and others can see us doing that and be drawn to worship God as well. Acts 16, verse number 25. But also realize this. In trying to serve God, trying to work in the kingdom, trying to do what's right, there are always going to be naysayers. There are always going to be adversaries. There's always going to be critics. And there's always going to be somebody who's trying to discourage you from doing the work of God. Did you know that happened in the book of Ezra? Look in Ezra chapter 4, and I want you to notice verses 1 through 5. Here the people are trying to rebuild the temple, and the Bible says this, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to the Zerubbabel and the heads of the fathers' houses and said to them, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel and Yeshua and the rest of the heads of the father's house of Israel said to them, You may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, for, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in the building. Now, Watch this. They hired counselors against them to frustrate the purpose all, their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until Darius, king of Persia. These people, their heart's not in it. 
they're not worshiping the one and true God. They act like they want to have a part in it, but Zerubbabel and Joshua say, no, 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 we know what is really going on here. And you see that in verses 4 and 5. They troubled them. They tried to frustrate their purpose and they discouraged them all the days of Cyrus and all the days of Darius, king of the Persians. Friend, there's always going to be people who are jealous. There's always going to be people who are bitter. There are always going to be people who may belittle or make fun of you for trying to serve God. Don't let them discourage, trouble, and frustrate you from doing what's right. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58 reminds us, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing, listen to this, knowing that your labor is not vain in the Lord. What you're doing for God, that's what really matters. That's what really is going to matter on the other side. And yes, there may be critics. There'll be people who make fun of you. There may be people who belittle and try to frustrate and discourage you. Don't listen to it. Don't listen to that noise. Stay focused on serving God and putting Him and His kingdom first. Now, with this work though, with the work of God, let's realize everybody, not just a few, everybody ought to help and pitch in with God's work, right? Look in Ezra chapter 5, and I want you to see what happened here. Ezra chapter 5, look in verse 1 and 2. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the sons of Iddo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Shealtiel and Yeshua, the son of Jehozadak, Jehozadak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. Who all got involved? Who got their hands dirty here? Was it just the slaves or the servants or the lower class? No, there wasn't any of that. You've got the people... You've got the pre you've priest, you've got the prophets, you've got everybody there pitching in and getting their hands dirty in the work of God. What about today? Friend, there's no big me and little you. There's no somebody who's higher than everybody else and somebody who ought to be doing the work and somebody who ought to be sitting in the chief seat. <laughs> that don't work anymore. That never worked. What works? Matthew 20, verse 1. The kingdom of heaven is like a vineyard. What's well, a vineyard? It's a place of work where everybody goes to work and fruit, spiritual fruit, is produced unto God. And friend, with that work, there's blessings that come with it. Revelation 14, verse 13, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Friend, you can't be lazy in the kingdom. You can't expect somebody else to do your job. You can't have somebody do it for you. Everybody needs to pitch in and help with the work of God, reaching the lost, building up the church, doing good and helping those who are in need in our community. But you know, with that idea, what is it that's going to cause men and women to prosper spiritually? What caused these people to work so hard and prosper spiritually in the book of Ezra? And what will help us today? Friend, we find that the faithful proclamation of the Word of God, it's what calls men, it's what motivated and promoted men and women to do the work of God then, and it'll do the same thing today. Look at Ezra chapter 6. I want you to notice Ezra chapter 6, and I want you to see what's said in verse number 14. The Bible says, So the elders of the Jews built, and they prospered, watch this, they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo. They built it and finished it according to the commandment of God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. You ever think there was a time when people got tired? You ever think there was a time when people got a little, uh, a little tired of building the bricks and putting everything back and working so hard? Ezra, they, they prof, prof, prospered through the prophesying, the preaching of Haggai and Zechariah. Hey, they got in there, they encouraged them, they motivated them, they strengthened them, they got their hands dirty, and everybody prospered through the proclamation of God's Word through these prophets. 
Friend, what about today? Does the preaching of the gospel, when we hear the word of God proclaimed, when, when, when the gospel is foretold to us today, doesn't that motivate us? It ought to. Because Isaiah 55 verses 7 through 11 says, the word of God will accomplish that which it was sent for. It will not return void. We're told in 2 Timothy 4 verses 1 through 4, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The gospel motivates. The preaching of the gospel ought to encourage us to get up and get to work and, and do the things that God wants us to do in this life. And friend, here's what you can be sure of. To every person who takes up the mantle of working for God, God's care is going to be upon those who put their trust in Him. Look in chapter 8 of the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 8. I want you to look in verses 21 through 23. The Bible says this. Ezra speaking says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from Him all the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy of the road because we had spoken to the king saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. But his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So Ezra said, we fasted, we entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. God's going to take care just like he did in the time of Ezra. Here these people are facing another difficulty. There's an enemy who's trying to thwart their work, and they put their trust in God. And they told the king this, hey, God's going to take care of us. We're going to put our trust in him. You help us as God wants you to do. God will see us through this. Friend, when we decide to work for God, we decide to be busy building in the kingdom, doing the things God wants us to do as Christians, here's the confidence you can have. If I put my trust in God, He's always going to take care of me. Listen again to Matthew 6, with a special emphasis on the last part of that. Here's our work. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now listen to this. And all these things shall be added unto you. What things? Food, shelter, clothing, the necessities of life. I don't have to be filled with anxiety and worry because if I'm busy working in the kingdom... Just like Ezra said, we've told, we've promised, been promised, the hand of our God is upon us for good. And God's going to take care of His people today. This is why Peter would say, cast all your cares upon Him. He cares for you. Now, does that mean that from time to time we don't have to look and make sure that what we're doing and teaching and the way we're living is right? A well, friend, we do sometimes. And one of the things we'll see very clearly in the book of Ezra is that they needed to make a change. The people had done some things that were against the will of God, and they now needed to make a change. Uh, we learn in Ezra 9 and 10 that there's a sin that is going on in the camp of Israel. Some of the Israelites have now married foreign wives. That was against the law of God way back in the Old Testament. God told them not to marry the heathens, not to intermarry with them, not to have children with them, that they would drag them down into their idolatry. And you can see that throughout Israel's history. But now, some of these people have done that. And Ezra now approaches God in prayer. And he approaches the people in addressing this moral situation. And, and look at what the Bible says in Ezra chapter 10. What was necessary for them to make this right? Look in Ezra chapter 10, and I want you to see Verses 1 through 5. Now while Ezra was praying, while he was confessing, and while he was weeping and bowing before the house of God, a very large assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him from Israel, for the people wept very bitterly. Why? And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, spoke up and said to Ezra, watch what he says, We have sinned. Against our God, we have taken pagan wives from the peoples of the land, yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. 
Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those who have been born to them according to the advice of my master, of those who tremble at the command of our God, and let it be done according to the law. Rise, for this matter is your responsibility. We also are with you. Be of good courage and do it. Then Ezra rose, made the leaders of the priests, the Levites, and all Israel swear an oath that they would do according to this word. Friend, they had gone beyond the word of God. They'd got involved in marriages and had children to the pagan wives, and God had told them not to do that. They were in unscriptural marriages. And this man's advice, they had to get out of those, was exactly right. Matthew, today that same idea is true. Christians need to honor God's teaching in every area of our life. As it relates to marriage, we need to honor God's teaching. One, what's God's plan for marriage? Genesis 2 verse 24. For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. God's original plan for marriage is one man, one woman for life. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 9, the only exception was for fornication and then and only then does the innocent party have the right to remarry. Matthew 5, verse 31 and 32, if people find themselves in situations that are not according to that, while that's hard, while that's difficult, while there are no doubt be tears shed, friend, repentance demands a cessation, a stopping of the ungodly acts. Acts 3 verse 19, repent and turn. Luke 3 verse 6, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. And according to Colossians 3 verse 7, adultery is something you can live in and you've got to get out of that lifestyle. And so during the times of Ezra, there were some hard lessons they had to learn. But the main lesson was we need to listen to God. We need to work diligently in His kingdom. We need to stop letting the noise of the critics get in our ears. And we desperately need to live a life that's pleasing to Almighty God. Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel, if you've never become a Christian, won't you do that today? Believe in Jesus as God's Son. Repent of sin in your life and turn to Him. Luke 13, 3. Make the good confession. Acts 8, 36 and 37. And won't you do what Jesus said to be saved? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. We hope you'll join us next time as we study more from the Word of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the